The history of America can be seen through the eyes of baseball. Chicago, as the baseball town we now know, was created as the city itself was being formed. A city constantly going through changes needed something unifying to bring the populace together. Author David Rapp chronicles what the catalysts were in getting baseball started in the city, how an early population boom with the growth of baseball attendance formed modern-day Chicago. Chicago, at that first decade of the 20th century, had grown from 1 million people at the World's Fair of 1893 to 2 million people by 1903. So it was kind of a chaotic city. Baseball became the unifier, essentially, the thing that everybody could come and watch and feel part of the same team. So baseball games in Chicago started drawing 20,000, 30,000 fans, where three or four years earlier, a big crowd would have been five to 10,000. So they're getting twice as many people, sometimes three times as many people, to a game. Cubs uh, of this era did not play in Wrigley Field. Wrigley was built in 1914. The Cubs played on the west side, not the north side, in a stadium called West Side Grounds. When they started getting very successful, they kept expanding the stadium. And it never burned down, but it was a fire trap for sure. They could pack in 30 to 40,000 people on game days, and there was another 10,000 people milling around outside. They developed this incredible rivalry with John McGraw's New York Giants. McGraw's Giants had won the pennant in 04. They won the pennant again in 05, won the series, trotted around the country wearing jerseys that said world champions in 1906, and the Cubs trounced them. And McGraw was never able to beat Frank Chance's Cubs again for six more years. But it was an intense rivalry, not only with the team, but the two cities, because these two cities were essentially competing with each other for primacy in American economics and culture and society. Chicago started annexing land around it to grow bigger, so New York immediately annexed Brooklyn and Queens and part of Bronx to remain the number one most populous city. There was no radio then. That didn't come back until the 1920s. But there was a telegraph, and that was the amazing social media of its day, the telegraph. Newspapers used to have their own telegraph exchange. The reporters would communicate back and forth with each other and send their copy from city to city. Baseball was so popular at that time, people were desperate to know what was going on. The newspapers figured out they could print partial game scores in their afternoon editions and sell papers that way. The games weren't over yet, but they would say, in the fifth inning, the Cubs were ahead of the Giants 2-1. to one. And that would sell a paper. As much as anything, I, it turned out to be why baseball has such a grip on all of us and why spectator sports in America today is such a big part of our culture. It wasn't before this team came around. It was a, a minor part and almost shunted aside in favor of other uh, types of activities that were big in the, in the gay 90s, like bicycling and other things like that. Baseball really is a, a core part of our identity as Americans. And unlike the Cooperstown Devil Day myth, this team actually did exist. They're real players, real people. They had faults as well as uh, attributes, and everything about their life sheds a light on who we are today. From that point on, baseball became known as America's pastime, growing professional sports nationwide and around the world. As sports became more popular in Illinois, Chicago began to house many more sports teams. Despite numerous titles and championships by sports franchises that followed baseball, the Cubs and White Sox remain the backbone of athletic competition in Chicago and an historic link in the popularity of professional sports and baseball in America today. U.S. History Through the Eyes of Baseball, brought to you by AmericanInnings.org.